You're in great company. Our show today, as always, is all about people recognising that it really is okay to not be okay. So turn up your radio. It's a big happy Monday. It's the 20th of March. Uh, thank you, Bill Watts, for filling in for Steve's box of chocolates. And you said it was licorice all sorts, but we had a bit of fun listening to that. Anyway, welcome to my show where we recognise that it really is okay to not be okay and bringing to the airwaves hot, sometimes contentious topics that will provide you with some pretty in-your-face thought fodder for the week. Today we're talking about the impacts of leadership, good, bad or just downright mediocre. And to help me colour in the big picture, I have whom I and many others believe to be one of the greatest leaders going around. May I welcome to the studios of 94.13 WVC, it's Mr Paul Guerra. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much, Ray, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. I know, it's pretty exciting, isn't it? It is. I mean, we're sweating it out of it here, all your hair's gone curly from the humidity and... Yeah, sadly, I got caught in the rain a bit earlier today, so that's what happens when you got curly hair. Looks great, though. Thank Looks you. Looks really great. You should Thank do. You. you should do that more often. I'll try that. The the washed and dried look. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is a pleasure to have you here. Um, we are, as I said, going to be talking about leadership, and we know. Yep. Well, I know that you're one of the great leaders because we've had a bit of an association through Who Group, where I work for quite many years yep. and you've had quite an impact on some of the clients that we work with through your, that leadership. So, uh, but we caught up at a party recently. <laughs> we like to talk about that. Well, the finer parts. The finer yes. parts, but we did spend a lot of time on the couch together and not in the way that one would think, uh, Miss, Mrs. Guerra. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfectly tame. I had had a little bit too much to drink upon arrival. So I actually had to spend the whole party just sitting it out with my water and you kept me company. We did watch the cricket, as we I did. recall, as yes, well, so, which right. was nice. But during that time, we did unpack a lot of themes that we're going to talk about today, which gave us the idea of getting together on radio and talking about this really, really important topic around leadership and the impact it has on, on people. Yep. So tell me, Paul, where did you go to primary school? We go right back to the start here. I'm actually a local boy. I went to ah. primary school in Our Lady of Lourdes in Bayswater. Yes. So I, and I know the the Box Hill area. In fact, I know the eastern suburbs yes. uh, really well. My grandmother lived in Box Hill, so you know, it, was, it was a regular visit mm. down there, down Davy Street and Bolton Street near the oh, footy ground there. Know exactly where that is. So which was you know, sort of great, lovely uh, yes. big house, big family occasions. Mm. Always go there. But uh, the the family home for me was in Bayswater. And yes. I was one of five children. Um, and mum and dad, so we all grew up in a, a rather small, twelve square house. And in I think Basie. That, yeah, in Basie, in as a Basie boy. And then once went to kindergarten in Bayswater, mm. um, went to primary school in Bayswater, and our ladies there, and then went to uh, secondary school at St Joseph's in Fentry Gully. So I was wow. in St Joe's regional, regional College. I was a big boy. I was allowed to yeah. catch the train back then, so, wow. which was good. Well, back in those days, I'm surprised that you survived uh, Fentry Gully, Bayswater and, and the likes. I had a good group of friends that uh, made yeah. sure that we got to the train station <laughs> and got to school and then back again. So. But it's quite different days, isn't it, when you think about Oh, back absolutely. Then. You know, I don't know that I'd let my children uh, no. walk around the streets in the same way that, no. that I did back then. In fact, mm. you know, paper round, which yes. I know we talked about uh, we previously. Did. I was doing a paper round at mm. nine. Mm. Just me and my next door neighbour, Derek, we'd mm. be off. No mobile phones, mm. no two-way radio, off delivering papers around the neighbourhood. You think about that today. But do you think, though, Paul, that we just reported things differently back then? I think we've become such a more conflatist in, in the way that we use language and also you know back in those days you didn't talk about lots of different things that happened to you and you know yep. even a lot of people coming forward that have been you know damaged as as children and now coming forward as adults talking about it so yeah I think so I think we were um, less prepared to say um, mm. and more prepared to um, believe authority yes. rather than challenge it yes yeah. And you've got uh, younger kids or you've had younger kids that have gone through the school system and how yeah. they're, I guess, coached around things like stranger danger and, you yeah. know, building strategy around keeping safe. You know, we didn't have any of that. So Yeah, yeah no, that's true. I mean, you think Neighbourhood Watch. Yeah. I mean, it's not that old in the scheme of things. No. It certainly wasn't around when we were growing up. No. But, but talking about things like mobile phones, you spend a lot of time at the top at um, Motorola. Did, yeah. And when you arrived today, we're talking about... Even the change in that industry has been so astronomical and so fast that, you know, talking about how do you manage the people within those settings 
through change as well as, as trying to lead innovation. Yeah, it's probably the greatest challenge, I think, at the moment for um, leaders, the change that's occurring everywhere and, you know, the technological change that mm. you were talking about. The, the mobile phone industry is only about 30 years old. Really? So I saw the birth of it um, yes. back at Motorola. I still remember the and old... the afterbirth. <laughs> the afterbirth, and it continues to go on in the way Dare the I networks say. have then picked it up. But it's... It's different ways now that mm. we have to use to engage the people um, within the staff group. Yes. And it's not just a matter of, of sitting down and talking to them because some people would actually prefer to be spoken to over a text message rather than face-to-face. Yes. So it's, it's how do you use all those mechanisms to be able to communicate. Yes. It means that change has to happen differently than what it's had in the past. Yes. And yep. in some ways, that's great opportunities. You know, for us in Australia... Mm. You know, that change has meant that we can play on the global platform yes. rather than having to travel every time we needed to do something. That's right. But we're still working with the human condition though, aren't we? And, yeah. you know, when you know, if we talk, think more about, say, corporate change and what it's like when you're leading a group of people, whether it's yep. thousands of people or tens of people, you know, for you evolving through that 30 years, yep. how has that changed and how have you changed in that space? Uh I've grown and I, I still grow every day. Mm. Uh, so for me, every day is about learning. I haven't mm. stopped learning from the, the time I started. Mm. I, I think the biggest change that I've seen over um, my leadership journey is the focus on people. Mm. Um, and it, it, it's been there in different uh, forms, but I think we're now entering the environment where the ability to inspire and engage staff mm is the way to get um, yes. staff on side, generate that spirit, which we all want to talk mm. about, generate that culture, mm. which is really important. And ultimately, it's the way to include people in, in their everyday life, which mm. you know, in most cases centres around work. Yes, and I think, you know, we were even talking about how as children growing into communities and work communities, do you think that we have a lot more now around tools and techniques that do engage people? That are uh, much better. I, th I think that's right, but I'm not sure we know how to use that as that effectively point. as we can mm. yet. So I think all the tools are there, mm. um, but I think every leader is still developing in, in how they actually do that. Mm. Uh, and I think it, it's being prepared to be vulnerable. Uh, we've as got, a leader? As a leader, yes. yeah. It, being prepared to share the journey, include people um, to actually create that um, journey, being prepared to discuss the challenges that are ahead because mm. I think a good leader now will actually pose, this is the challenge that we've got. Yes. I don't have all the answers. Um, <laughs> and even if I do, they may not be the right answers. Mm. Whereas you've got a group of people out there that are living it every single day that are actually probably closer to some of the issues than what you are. So the yes. ability to engage um, those. But importantly, I think it's the ability to engage people to, you know, what's the culture that the organisation mm. wants around, be it a sporting mm. club, be it a workplace. Yes. What's the culture? You know, mm. what are, what as leaders are we standing for? And then what are we trying to inspire mm. the, the people that are part of that collective mm. uh, to be as well? And, and being real about culture too. You know, in the yep. space I work in, people bandy around culture like, you know, it's a glass of water. But what is culture? And I know working at, at Who Group, you know, we're a startup organisation seven years in that has expanded astronomically but maintained the culture that we agreed upon. Yeah. So we, we carry the culture within ourselves. It's not like we wrote it on a wall and said this is who we're going to be. We actually became it. So anyone that comes into it immediately gets, gets absorbed into yeah. that into that way of being and some of it's downright inappropriate paul i can i can <laughs> tell you but it works for us it does yeah and that's when you've got a great culture it mm. works and what happens in an environment where there's a great culture the the people that are going to fit fit mm. and the people that don't fit within that will actually self-select out yes and that means that achieving for that organization is so much easier because you're getting the right type of people yes. within that organization and speaking of the right people inside organisations, you not only get across, you know, your day-to-day -day business as usual leadership role, but you also work with organisations, not-for-profits like um, Red Dust. Yep. You sit on the board at the Victoria, the Queen Victoria Market yep. and also the Australia Day. Yep. Um, you're on the board there? or I'm an, an, a, ambassador, an ambassador, Australia Day ambassador. So there are leadership roles as well, but in very, very different settings, especially in the volunteer setting where expectations of leaders are very different. Yep. Uh, also, Queen Vic Market, we were saying before, you know, such an iconic space. 
that you know people must be coming to all the time. What are you doing with our market? Yeah. Uh, like it's your total responsibility. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that diversity? Yeah, it's look, it, it challenges me, mm. um, but I love that the challenge that that brings. If running an organisation or being responsible for an organisation in its own right means that I, I get very hands on. Mm. Um, whereas when you move into a you're board not selling world, vegetables or anything that hands on <laughs> <laughs> at the not, meat market. Not quite. That, Chuck steak four ninety nine. <laughs> You can get a job there. I'll tell some <laughs> of the butchers and some of the traders there that you're you're available. It's great to be able to have that bigger mm. picture, um, and then as you create that bigger picture, have people within the organisation, you know, through the CEO down, that's then able to deliver uh, mm. on that bigger picture as well. It's a fabulous project uh, yes. for Melbourne. You know, mm. when you think about it, it's been alive for 140 years. Yes. And if you want to talk about change, that's evolved every yes. single day. Mm. Right? And it's evolved a lot without too much intervention of uh, management mm. or in this case, um, mm. the board. But we're at a point now where for it to continue to evolve, mm. it actually needs some money spent on it. It okay. needs to become adaptable. Yes. So the, the simple type of things that, that we're making is, you know, for starters, the sheds will remain. So we're not okay. changing any oh, of that. <laughs> yes. um, all of the structures that you see there today will absolutely mm -hmm. remain. Uh, we're lucky but unlucky, and it, it's, it's funny because this um, pulls me every time. We're actually mm. built on top of a cemetery. I know. That was my next question. Mm. And yes. the, the Dead centre of town. It, is it, it was a temporary market when it started, but mm. because it was so popular, uh, mm. it expanded. And, and it then grew <laughs> over the top of a cemetery, which is yes. know, quite weird, but mm. you know, that, that's a fact of it. So what we've got is, is a difficult template to work with, mm. but we know um, we get one shot at uh, making sure that the facilities are there for the next 140 years. Yes. So we'll go down underneath uh, what we call A, B and C sheds, which is yes. the closest to Victoria Street. Mm. So there'll be a car park put under there. Okay. The car park that sits there now will be transformed into a beautiful open space. All right. And I think that will just be fabulous yes. for that end of Melbourne. And mm. we can do a bunch of things with that after mm. it's done, which means then that the cars, the forklifts and the trucks Yes. get taken up away from, from above ground mm. and they get put underneath. And that's a health and safety issue oh, as well absolutely. that we're becoming more and more I focused live with upon that every too. Day. You know, I'd, I'd hate to pick up a phone and yes. for somebody to tell me that somebody's been critically injured mm. um, as a result of a forklift or a car or a truck. So that's we'll right. get rid of that in yes. today's day and age, but the rest of it stays the same. Great. So I can tell everybody out there, you know, let's not panic. There you go, now, listeners. Yeah. We, we will make sure that this remains as a great market. You can walk over dead Victoria. people for another 100 year, years <laughs> <can>. yet. Yeah. <laughs> tell us a bit about Red Dust, Paul. Yeah, Red Dust is, a, 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 I think, one of the the most fabulous things I'm involved in. So mm. we, we do a lot of work with the Indigenous communities and they're typically the remote communities in yes. the Northern Territory where we're sending a message to the youth um, in the Indigenous community that mm. there is a future. And we do that um, by using role models, typically yes. sporting uh, role models, but we do do a bit of music uh, role models as well. Yes. And it's fabulous seeing the kids out of nowhere, as soon as they hear a ball bounce, <laughs> coming out from behind a tree or out of the classroom. And then when they recognise the personality that's there, whether it be Alan Border or whether it wow. be a famous uh, footballer, their eyes light up yes. and they're off. And our promise to them is if you go to school mm. right, and you take in the education that's there for you, mm. we'll help you after school to not only play games with your sporting stars, yes. but we'll start to teach you about nutrition and other things which will help the children as they grow up and hopefully yes. inspire them to then move through the education system. Is that within all states of Australia, Paul? At the moment, we're in Northern Territory. Okay. Um, we've done a little bit in uh, Western Australia mm. uh, previously, and believe it or not, mm. we've done a little bit of work in India um, as well a couple of years back. So oh. They face a similar problem to yes. Australia in terms mm. of their Indigenous communities yes. and the difference in wealth and poverty in India is, is quite stark. So we've done a lot of work in yes. the poverty areas over there too. Oh, it's, I mean, it's just so, so great. I, I wish we had two hours to talk about this, but we don't. And we're, we are heading up for another break. But when we're coming, when we're coming back, we're going to continue talking about the impact of leadership on the humble human condition and unwrap a bit more of the, some of the big topics around, you know, trust, engagement. You know, what does it really look like for Australian businesses who aren't recognising the importance of addressing how people are feeling in their workplace? And you're with Ray Bonney, joined by Paul Guerra, our leadership expert today, handpicked by me, because, after all, it is my show. And, um, Paul, you and I were having such a chat 
in the studio. I'm mm. very, very particular about my techni technical ability here. And I'm really sorry I shouted at you. I said, shut up. <laughs> Hard <laughs> like, not to uh, guitar strum to that song, isn't I it? Know. <laughs> I thought, oh, my God, George Michael is about to stop singing and we, we better get back on air. So I won't apologise for that because, as always, it's great conversation. Uh, now, you've been a leader for ages with a great reputation, as we know. I know that from people I work with. And here's what some other people have said to you. I did a bit of digging around on you, Paul Guerra, on the, on the Googles last night. And this is what they say. Paul is an empathic leader, a visionary strategist and a natural coach and mentor. He has a passion for what is right and he's able to cut through the clutter to get results. He's a damn good bloke as well. And whoever wrote that spelt it incorrectly as well. Uh, <laughs> Paul is an extremely results oriented leader, able to make difficult decisions as well as execute change with a humanistic approach to achieve better strategic outcomes. His confidence, passion, energy, enthusiasm and relentless drive for results are infectious and are all key contributors to his success as an outstanding business leader. There you go. That's very humbling. I'm throwing very tissues humbling. at him now because he's crying. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, have a little cry and we'll get back on air. <laughs> but Paul, you know, those kind of statements really, really do suggest that in terms of your leadership, people trust you, mm -hmm. they're engaged with you yep. and, you know, you're approachable yep. and, and flexible. So I know from where I sit in mental health advocacy and also what we spruik at Who Group, trust and engagement are the biggest drivers of productivity. Yep. Would you agree? I do, yeah. I mean, once you get to that level, mm. uh, we talk about this thing called discretionary effort. Yes. And that's where you know people want to give above what they're paid to, yes. to give. Now, that's not only in time, but it's in attitude as well. And, mm. you know, the, the cycle of a workday is actually quite gruelling when you think about it. Mm. You know, to concentrate for seven and a half, eight hours or Especially you know, when that might – oh, here, I've just smacked my hand into the CD player – but that can start at, you know, five o'clock in the morning with gym and kids and yep. school drop-offs and so that, yeah, so it can do continue. Yeah, so it, it means that to concentrate over the, the course of the day is quite difficult despite mm. all the breaks. So yes. to, to be able to inspire people um, to continue to, to give even when the energy levels may, may be low, it comes back down to, you know, the type of things that you talked about. You know, mm. For me, naturally for me, I love working with people. Yes. Um, and my driver is everybody that, that works with me. Mm. How do I help them achieve mm. what their potential yes. um, is? And that was instilled in me from a, a very young age. And I've been lucky to have some great managers, some great mm. mentors along yes. the way that their whole focus has been around people. But interestingly, though, you studied engineering. I did. You're not supposed to care about people. I know, I'm You're supposed, supposed to, to care machine, about things. <laughs> it was funny. I got to the end of the engineering degree and my dean... Uh, said to me, he goes, I'm not sure why you did engineering. I don't mm. think you're going to be in it for too long. Yeah. I looked at him and said, you could have told me that four and a half years ago uh, before I started. So. But, but how it was some a good of those grounding. principles and practices, though, of engineering yeah. help you today? Yeah, so an engineer is, has a very good process brain. Yes. So able to problem solve yeah. um, relatively quickly. And a lot of things we do in a day, believe it or not, actually has a process behind mm. it. So from an engineering perspective, I'm able to understand yes. The process when you think about either a work day or even mm. a sporting um, environment it's a lot about yes. um, process so being able to understand that mm. and then translate the complex yes to the simple so that everybody can understand Th that's is, right is a skill because people feel safety and containment they yep. feel safety when they've got objective when they've got purpose and without that structure or infrastructure around that person or the team or the organization people can feel very very vulnerable so what you're describing now is being able to put that into something meaningful yeah. around people and it was one of the greatest challenges i had when i left engineering mm. and moved across to the the dark side as it was back then into sales i was yes. really lucky i had a, a, a fabulous coach and leader mm. and he's a dear friend of mine today david cox um, and his associate martin carl that, that yes. really guided me across through there because yeah an engineer then moving into a, 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 you know, a completely uncertain process yes. in sales was, was difficult. It was yeah. that back in the 90s? It was, yes. yeah. So I was back in uh, 93 mm. when the Bombers won the flag. Ah, we guess Bombers. Supporter we'll here. be talking so, about that later in the show. Yeah. Yes, we will be. So, um, so it, was, it was that journey there and it was, it was a really tough 12 months. Mm. But you know, I got there and I understood it and did a lot of training mm. and a lot of self-reflection through that period as well. And as I said, lucky with the support yes. that I had from... Yeah, not only David and Martin, but also yes. from my wife at the time as well. Oh, good on you all, guys. I hope you're all listening in. But, you know, on that, Paul, what do you think the importance of 
you know, ex experience and I mean real experience from the ground up, a lot of managers will enter management roles from nowhere. So yep. with no experience straight out of university, but never ever having the empathy. What does it feel like being a salesperson out on the road? Yeah, it's for me, that's um, one of the things I'd like to see mm. more. And we talk a lot about the, the younger ge generation coming through. I don't mm. think it's actually changed over generations. Mm. The, the race to be CEO yes. um, for most people is too quick. Mm. I'd rather people actually get grounded in each of the roles that they take on and actually understand the role before taking their next step. Mm. Now, they won't realise it at the time, but when they're finally seated at the top level mm. and if they haven't had that grounding, things start to disintegrate mm. underneath them. So my, my counsel to the younger people coming through, know your craft, learn your craft, become yes. expert at your craft before you take the next step. And you know, that is perhaps where it's left once you loved your, love your craft and know it, I know that I love mine. I don't want to manage somebody in doing what I do yeah. because I want to keep it all to myself. And yeah. therefore, I don't think I would make a good manager because I would always be very, very seduced um, and distracted by what I really wanted to do. So being a manager or being a CEO isn't necessarily the greatest thing to be doing. It's tough. Mm. And there's, there's a lot of lonely days as mm. the CEO because mm. as much as you have a team underneath you and you try and build that um, mm. trust, that preparedness to be vulnerable doesn't yes. come naturally for you know a lot of people. No. So, you know, to be a great leader, you have to be find a way to be vulnerable. Yes. So, the, the type of things that I've been able to do is develop a really good friendship group and a really mm. you know, strong mentor group. So, mm. not only within the, the people that report to me, but external mm. to the company as well, because you need people looking at you to be able to pick you up at different yes. times and say, "Hey, Paul, you're not yourself today." Yes, uh, can. Yeah, let, let me buy you a coffee and let me talk through it. Mm. Or, you know, is there something you know, that, that's bothering you? Because yes. you don't have that same smile. You don't have that same bounce. Yes. So it's great to have people surrounding you that are prepared to look after mm. you in the way that you're prepared to look after them as well. Because it is okay for leaders not to be okay, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, uh, I heard a story coming out of the tragedy that happened in January in Melbourne CBD when many people were, were killed. And yep. I heard a story about a, a barrister and he almost got hit by by the car. And when he went back un up to his chambers, he was crying because yep. he'd almost collided. And of course, that whole emotion that engulfed Melbourne on the, at that particular moment was very, very overwhelming. And he was crying. And somebody turned around and said, "He's crying. That's not right. You yep. know, he's he's a, he's a leader. Yep. He's the big guy. He shouldn't be crying." And it really, it made me so sad to think that that's how we see a lot of our leaders or a lot of the people that are experts in their field, that they're, you know, they're not, they're not vulnerable to feeling. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, that we, there's something to think about, that leaders are real. And we're going to talk about that more in the next segment, but yeah. it kind of just came, came well, to mind. I mean, I have a huge respect for the Lord Mayor. He's also a very close friend of mine. Yeah. Um, for the Lord Mayor to come out, who's a very strong, yes. very positive individual, I actually say, actually, that week has taken its toll on me. I need yeah. to take a break. Mm. Uh, I think he's just fabulous. Yes. And he's prepared to do that. Mm. Um, his leadership through that whole um, aftermath was yes. was completely Beautiful. brilliant. Mm. But I love the example that he's setting to say, mm. you know what? You know, I'm not okay. I need to take some time yes. off go and refresh myself, spend some time back with his beautiful family and mm. then get back into the position mm. of, of running the city. I think, yeah, mm. more power to him. Yeah, no, really good story, Paul. And, you know, that is something that's he's still leading by yeah. example, you know. Like we say, it's okay to not be okay and what do you do when? And how do you, you know, create those support networks for yourself? And scarily, a lot of people haven't considered that the world might change like it did on that day yep. and therefore don't have support networks and one of the exercises I do in my in my workshops is support circles I'm drawing them here in in the air but in the middle support is where do you go to straight away hmm. when something happens when something changes quite often it's your family your friends or your wife husband yep. sometimes people don't have the privilege of having those people yep. the next circle could be you know your people at the gym your workmates and as the circles blend out, then, you know, your support network is, is, is less and less. But the people that have nobody in those inner two circles yep. is, is frightening. Yeah, it is. When I look across uh, society, it's difficult. But, it, you know, some of it is within our control. You know, yes. Some of it is the foundations that we build. Mm. You know, if, if you come from a, a family environment, mm. invest in it. Mm. You know, 
most of us go to school, you know, invest yes. in the friendships um, mm. at school and then invest in friendships at the sporting clubs mm. or whatever clubs you know, you're there because those friendships yes. uh, will be as important as family mm. to get you through the tough times. Yes, you know. and it doesn't have to be. If you don't have the benefit of having those social close constructs, there are other things. You know, I'm very proud to say next week I have the amazing Tim Watson coming as my guest Can I be on here? The show. <laughs> it's actually going to be over the telephone because he's very busy with all sorts of things but you know growing up myself it was very very difficult for me and you know mm. I didn't have a lot of reason to live and he gave me a reason to live you know yeah. when he arrived from Dimbula at the age of 15 mm. I was about 11 at the time and you know we'll be talking about that on the show but so it doesn't have to be you know your immediate family it can be just something that makes you feel connected and and he did. So tune in, uh, folks, next week and you can hear about how that all happened. But how fabulous mm. for somebody like Tim yeah. to take an interest um, in you and I presume he'd never met you at, at that point in time. No. Um, he wouldn't have understood the lifeline that he was providing no. you and, and you know, leadership comes in different styles. That's right. That's another one of them. That's right and that's a moral and an ethical responsibility when you're in a position Yep. of whatever that might be, an iconic position. And today we're talking about leadership. So my, I guess my questions are around what kind of people are we putting into leadership roles and is that healthy for them? And conversely, is the style of leadership healthy for the people that are reporting up into that, into that space? And, yeah. you know, you've, you've clearly done it really, really well, but, you know, there's, there's also a price to pay on that as well, isn't there? There is, and you've got to keep it in perspective. I, I've had as I said, some great people um, around me. And, you know, one of the strongest pieces of advice I'd have is, you know, Paul, you're going to have a lot offered um, mm. to you, but always choose family first. Yeah. Uh, and it was one of the decisions I made. I, I, was, was that commentary yeah. from a guy called Barry Jennings out of um, Perth yes. that I used to determine to come home from Singapore? Yes. Um, you know, I could see it in my, my middle boy's eyes, Matthew, yes. that, you know, he was struggling without dad being home yes. um, through the week. So, you know, we'd was hard on Amelia with yeah. the three kids at home. So for yeah. me, it was like, I'm, I'm sacrificing yes. too much. You know, I've got the mm. greatest of corporate lives, mm. but I'm starting to lose contact mm. with my family. And that's the grounding that I talked about. So it was an easy decision in the end to say, mm. you know what, family first. Mm. And it worked out. Yes, right? it does. It, it has a funny thing how that uh, always works you out. You jump so. and the safety net will appear. Yep. But it's, you've got to yes. invest. But you've also made a recent transition too uh -huh. out of Optum. Yep. Do you want to talk a little bit yeah, about that? Yeah, so after the break? five years um, running Optum, um, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about Optum because I think yes. it's doing some fabulous stuff in the yes. mental health mm -hmm. um, and workspace. Um, my next step was going to be offshore. Mm. I'm not ready for offshore. Mm -hmm. um, again, that'll come sometime in the future. We don't want to so. lose you. No, I don't, I don't want to lose Australia yes. either. I love Melbourne, and that's. Mm. You know, I've made a commitment to be here mm. uh, for at least the next 10 years as mm. the kids get through school and then uni and I don't want to leave yet either. I'm happy to travel and see different mm. parts of the world and contribute, but you know, I want to stay yes. based here. And the challenge came, you know, Paul, the next uh, role for you is offshore. Yes. Um, you know, that was going to happen sooner than I wanted it to happen. Yeah. So for me, it was an easy decision to say, you know what, I've done five years, mm. you know, time to take a break and just recharge the batteries a little bit, mm. go and see what else is out there and invest, as I, yes. I talk about, in some, some other areas, in helping some other people, yes. um, and then get back into corporate life. So cha change is in the wind. Change is definitely in the wind. But going yeah. back to Optum, as, as you know, it's close to my heart, yeah. EAP provider, and for people that don't know what that is, it's Employee Assistance Program. So it's what supports people in the ex exterior world. So even though Optum itself is a huge organisation, global, how many people would Optum employ, Paul? About 200,000 globally. Mm. Yeah. That's it's a one lot of the people. largest companies globally. <laughs> so, and yeah. how many people were you responsible for here in Melbourne? There was about 120 across mm. uh, Asia Pacific. Yes. And the majority of those were employed in uh, Melbourne. Mm. But then we had associations with um, psychologists. That's right. Uh, all over Australia, in fact, all over Asia Pacific. Who were all Melbourne. wearing your brand. Yeah, they were. Mm. Yeah. So there's that whole dual thing, isn't there? You've got your internal people that you, you're taking care of yourself, but also very mindful of your external providers who are touching, that you can triple the amount of people that they touch every single day. It was a real eye-opener for me. Um, mm. I'd been involved um, in you know, products, you know, largely telco, for yes. 20 years. So you know, helping people 
what I call live better lives through the use of technology. Mm. I'd not touched on that softer side and, mm. and here we were in Optum providing a service which was effectively, in some cases, keeping people alive. Mm -hmm. uh, we would take a phone call probably once a week of somebody that was at, that was their last phone call. Yes. If we didn't pick up the phone, then that person probably wouldn't be with us mm. um, through to, you know, just different forms of depression or mental mm. health before it developed into That can lead into else. something else. That's yes. right. And the, the team that's that's there is, do a fabulous job from mm. the front line all the way through to the psychologist mm. to do it. But but just understanding what happened and, mm. and the people that were taking the initial phone calls and then talking to the psychologist mm. and then looking at the stats across the whole of industry as yes. to how many people are... Are, are suffering a mental health moment mm. at different courses of their career. Mm. Mapping that then, we know that the percentage across the board through the Medicare stats, mm. about 10% are suffering depression, mm. um, or population are suffering depression. Yes. We're not seeing that come through in the mm. workplace yet. We're seeing about 5% uh, right. typically, which means that there's still a 5% that we're not seeing mm -hmm. that you know, should be getting attention and could be getting attention. Yes that can live even better lives. However, right. I know the, the stigma just squashes all of that in. Yeah, and there's, look, there's great people like you that are helping to work against mm. um, that stigma and there's more and more people that are prepared to come out and say, you know, you know what, this is this is me, Beyond Blue's done yes. a fantastic job mm. in relation to that mm. as well. You know, and we talked about the Lord Mayor, you know, James Hood, yes. for, for all the issues, put his hand up on Saturday mm. and said, you know what, I'm not afraid to seek help. Yes. And you know, good on him for doing that. It does not discriminate. And I'm wondering also, I'd love to talk to you about more about statistics if we had time, but yep. you know, Optum being a global organisation, you know, do you see trends in different levels of um, of organisational, um, whatever that word is? Because yeah, I've, we do, and you can actually see into an organisation. Yeah, things yes. like bullying, which is a relatively new phenomenon. Yes. Um, it, it's only new in terms of it's now being prepared to being called out, mm. but that's been going on for years. We've yes. now got employees that are prepared to put their hand up and say, mm. you know what, you can't do that, and mm. rightly so. It's one of the greatest shifts I think we've seen in mm. the past five years is mm. not only does a workplace have to be safe physically, yes. it has to be safe mentally. Yes. And that's great news for the employee, mm. but it's where leaders have to move to as well because That's there's right. not enough leaders that actually understand mm. that not only does the workplace need to be safe physically yes. you need to look after your people from a mental space and oh. that means mm. taking an interest in them and what they're doing mm. and starting to notice the change if they're not themselves find mm. out what is going on because that question might just I mean, help the, them recover. The game changer mm. and I think you know especially because I work with this every day it's not possible to solve things for people but any leaders that are listening to think, well, what do I do? Start thinking about creating an environment that supports how people are feeling. Not solving people's mental health, but creating that environment that supports how people are feeling. You've got a much better chance of somebody having a better kind of bad day than yep. just having a downright bad day and where they don't want to turn up to work. And, you know, our statistics show that of the $10.6 billion that goes down the drain every day by organisations not addressing how their people are feeling, 6.1 of that is due to presenteeism. That's people turning up to work and not being engaged. And I think 146 uh, million of that is workers' compensation stuff, yep. which is nothing yep. compared to it. And that's where we think it sits because risk we see as physical yep. but we don't see that whole co comorbid piece that's physical and mental just play so intricately together that we really must be looking at that whole you know that integrated piece one of the greatest stats i was seeing to highlight the mm. the, the whole side of the, yep. the mental health um, if a person presents with both a, a back condition and a mental health condition yep. If you treat the back condition before you treat the mental health yes. condition, you get a very small percentage of recovery. Yes. If you treat the mental health condition first yes. and then treat the back condition, your success rate is up around the 90% mark and that highlights the strength of the mind. <laughs> and there, there, is, there is another whole program as well on that. It's, um, it's, it's fascinating stuff when you think about the psychosomatic yep. piece, but you're right, if you're feeling good, you're yep. more likely going to recover quickly from, from whatever it is you can. And if you spend a lot of time in the workplace feeling good there, you've got a much better chance of being a productive, engaged person that directly impacts the bottom line. Create the right culture.
Think That's about what it. It's about. <laughs> anyway, you're listening to 94.1. It's 3WBC and you're in safe hands with me. I'm Ray Bonnie, where I give you absolute permission to be very okay, not to be okay. And I'm so privileged to have the very accomplished Paul Guerra in the studio with me today, giving us an amazing insight into what it might feel like to be a corporate leader in the Australian workplace. I think we've lost the listening audience now. <laughs> John Farmer gets really upset when I sing because I'm so bad at it, but I, I actually don't mind. I think it really engages our listeners to see what our true strengths are, Paul. <laughs> and mine clearly is not singing, sadly. <laughs> and I just, I surprised you with that one, didn't I? You didn't think you'd be singing on air. No. I think being shaken all night long, it sort of gets back to our oh and stuff, doesn't it? I don't think it's the, the greatest thing. I'm a chronic insomniac, but we do love that song. But anyway, if you've just tuned in, you're listening to 90. 4.1 FM. It's 3 WBC and I'm Ray Bonney joined in the studio today by Paul Guerra and he's helping me demystify some of the stereotypes around what it's really like being a workplace leader here in Australia. And many forget, Paul, that leaders, whether it's managers, CEOs, business owners, MDs, oh gosh, the labels go on and on. They're human beings as well with feelings and, you know, we so often especially see in our media when it comes to politicians, sport people, industry leaders, that they're just slammed. And yep. what what must that feel like to go home to your family, to your kids, and go, wow, that's I'm just doing my job. Yeah, and that's that's a society thing. Mm. We're very quick to judge mm. um, now, and that's not the leader's fault. That's society's yes. fault that we're able to make our opinion up mm. when we've actually never met um, the yes. individual. I had a great opportunity to meet Nathan Buckley mm. years ago, and and the Nathan Buckley that we saw on the Footy Show is not the Nathan Buckley that is the person. I said oh, that what is the, what is the name? He's really nice, though, isn't he? Oh, he's fa- absolutely fabulous. Yes, and will, is, is an outstanding leader. Make no question about yes. um, that. And as you said, you know, Paul, I could never get my true self out on the show for a whole bunch of reasons so you know is that because it's like scripted or yeah, and that's where the show needed him or wanted him to go and that's yes. that's what he got stuck with yes so but yeah, it's a great example of mm. we we build a perception up of yes. the people that we see based on you know what we've been able to observe mm. and some of us cling to that perception mm. rather than actually sitting down and meeting the person and yes. understanding what they're about that's right. And, you know, Steve Carey, your friend and yeah. my friend. Great uh, friend Steve. Steve Carey, Newsflash Media, ex-news director of Channel 7. If you're listening, Steve, hello. You're coming back on my show on Friday. <laughs> but Steve does a great segment for me on my Friday breakfast program called Scary Media Moments yep. where we talk exactly about that, Paul, and that's what role does the media play and how do we as consumers unravel what it actually means. Yep. And how do we really get to the crux of what's real? And uh, it's really difficult sometimes. It is, but therein lies the opportunity for the modern leader. Yes. Um, work out how what what you stand for. Yes. Work out how you communicate that. Yes. And work out how you're taking your staff, your organisation on that journey. Yes. Um, but in terms of understanding people and the insights of that and what Steve does on a Friday morning is – is fabulous yes. because he's been there and he's done it all um, and he's able to present us back the insights on that. Yes, that's right. And um, I think for, for people and for leaders, you know, I look at people like Malcolm Turnbull. I even look at Donald Trump. What mm. must that be like? After all, he is just, you know, a mortal human being. Yeah, I was having this discussion last night, actually. The, the sad part is if you go to the US, you'll get a very different view yes. of what um, – Donald Trump um, is up to. Yes. I, I don't quite understand the fascination uh, on why Donald gets a run in our media every single day <laughs> and we're only getting the snippets that the media wants to tell us. Now, that's yes. not the media's fault. They're only putting out there what they think what we want to hear. What consumers want, yes. And if we continue to click and read the story, then guess what? They're going to continue to put it out there because that's yes. what sells newspapers. Mm. And, you know, I, I think that Australia is with all due respect, full of armchair commentators who all have an opinion on what's going on and like to shout very loudly, which I think is what you're saying generates the kind of media that we're seeing, whereas, you know, there's few of us that are actually out there just doing the work and don't have time to read the media. But that's where we talk technology Mm. uh, before. That's where technology's taken us. Mm. Um, The ability to be the armchair critic um, is there. And that's one thing. How does the individual take it? And that's where... 
you know, teaching kids about Facebook and yes. you know, the, you know, the, the more um, business person about LinkedIn mm. um, and what it can do mm. and some of the pitfalls on it. You see so many kids now that if they don't get the right amount of likes on their Facebook page, can have a drastic impact yes. on how they feel for the next couple of mm. hours. And that's getting into dangerous territory. Mm. But again, that's up to the individual to manage. But it's real though, it's a real it feeling. Yep. You know, the human condition does not respond very well to rejection. Yep. So if you look at kids growing up in that, um, te you know, the social media generation, that's a real feeling when you're not liked. Yeah, it and is. We're not recognising that yeah. that's... I agree. I mm. mean, and as a leader, um, mm. we're susceptible now to mm. more and more commentary, you know, whether we like it or not. I've, mm. you know, the Queen Victoria market draws a lot of attention, um, <laughs> obviously, and it's, yeah. there's a couple of pages that I choose not to read before I go to bed because... <laughs> It does have an impact on on what I'm thinking, so I'll pick them up and read them in the morning. And how and you sleep? Yeah, it does. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you said, you know, we want to be respected. You know, we want yes. to be like no one likes to be bagged out, whether mm. you're a leader or whether, you know, you're not. It it, mm. it has an impact on the the, the individual. It it, abs it absolutely does. Uh, last year, I did a piece of work for a client, and not saying that I'm awesome, but I've. I don't think I've ever had negative feedback, not even slightly negative yeah. feedback, but this particular client hated what I did, yeah. hated so much that they sacked me and never spoke to me again. And whilst my intellectual side can go, well, not everyone's going to like the work you do because it could push a few buttons. Even today when I talk about it, it, it hurts my heart. Yeah. It, it actually hurts me physically yeah. to think about it. And you know, I don't think that's pride and ego, but it's just that feeling of having been rejected for something that you're so passionate about yeah. and so just absolutely involved in. So I can, so I really, really do empathise with any kind of leader, even if I don't agree with yep. perhaps what they stand for. I do really think about that human condition and say, what does it feel like being you? Yeah, and I think for all of us, before we judge, mm. let's understand the circumstances that that person finds themselves in mm. and understand why they may be doing what they're doing. Mm. So, Because in almost all cases, it's completely yes. different to the assumption that we've made. Yes. So for all of you armchair commentators that aren't doing anything but bagging people, think about what you're saying, think about who it's reaching and think about how they might feel before they go to sleep at night because they're getting up every day to continue the fight for whatever it is or continue the work that they're doing. And, you know, how about some constructive hmm. input would be yep. nice. Oh, that'd be great. Some I mean, support. Well, that's, I mean, ultimately that's what we need as humans. We need that support yes. um, around us to be able to do it. I don't, I don't think anybody makes a decision purely on self-interest no. um, in a leadership environment. No. I think they're doing it off the back of a, a number of factors and they're trying to balance as best they can the challenges that are on yes. them and the challenges that the organisation uh, faces. That doesn't mm. mean the decisions that they take are easy because no. they're not. No. Um, but ultimately they're doing it in the best interest um, mm. and I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time mm. in the best in interest of the organisation. Oh, if you go back to the what we were talking about before regarding trust and engagement, mm. I work with an organisation who's another startup here in Melbourne, but a global organisation. Yeah. And, you know, it's a husband and wife startup, but they're doing extremely well. But one thing that they do for their people, which really struck me, was leave. Yep. They have leave and you can take as much leave as you like. So it's not annual leave, it's not sick leave, it's not maternity leave, it's just called leave. However, when they do the stats on that, not one person in the organisation takes more than what the standard is. Wow. So there's that trust there to say, take what you need because we yep. trust you, but they create this environment that is so conducive to turning up and, like you said before, going over and above expectation. And that's why, I mean, there's a lot of articles about them and it's it's a really, really great story. Yeah, good on them. They've obviously developed a really strong culture mm. um, and, and within that it's permeated into the people that they've got. Yes, and, and that culture starts at onboarding. So who are we bringing into our organisation? Just because you have the technical skills, like you, a qualified yep. engineer, yep. doesn't mean that you're going to be good at it. Yep, correct. But, and, and just because you're a great salesperson doesn't mean you're going to be a great sales manager. No. Right. So it, it's understanding what the scope of that indi yes. individual is. I'd, I worked at the car park at VFL Park for, <laughs> for many, many years. <laughs> And my first supervisor there was a guy called Vaughan Hayes. Mm. And he, was, he was really simple. He said, you know, Paul, you have to understand that everybody that works here has the right role. 
Mm. Your challenge as a manager is to find that right role for them. And that was oh. in a simple environment like a car yeah. park. Now extrapolate that uh, yeah. into a business. His words are still correct. Right? Absolutely. That right role might be answering a phone. It might be EA. It, you know, it might be the finance director. Yes. It might be the marketing director. Mm -hmm. Equally, it might be time for that person to go on, you know, spread their wings a bit more and go and get some experience yes. out, um, elsewhere. Mm. But he made the point. Mm. You as the leader, you as the... What were you leading there in the car park? I was the supervisor of the VIP and all the way down car park one and car park two. So wow. it was good fun. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. would have come across our Dave Marnie at Who Group selling the um, AFL records, no doubt. Yes, Dave and I have compared notes about that. So. I don't think his job was as legitimate as yours, though. <laughs> Mine was good fun, I know that. Got to see a lot of footy in the early years. <laughs> <laughs> but what a great job, you know, to have. As it, what, that would have been in the 80s? Or the, yeah, it was. Mm. Uh, I was there up until uh, VFL Park closed. But again, yeah. it teaches you how to relate to people. You get That's some right. irate people, you get some people yes. that will break the rules and you'll get some people that will say thanks. Yes. And you'll see people like Dermot Brereton that every time he came through, mm. wound the window down and asked how you're going and you know, what the weather's <laughs> going to be like and da-da-da-da-da. Always happy to have a chat. I agree with you about Dermy actually. I My older kids growing up, they're in their 20s now, but he was big during that time and he, like Tim Watson, always found time to yep. stop and talk. And so, you know, for, for anything else that goes on with him, I'd stand by and say, yeah. you're, a, you're a good bloke, Demi. And that lasts, you know, that, th those type of impressions mm. last forever. Yes. Oh, absolutely. You know, we're talking about recognising opportunities or recognising talent and being brave enough to help somebody along. And I left school at 15, mm. asked to leave. <laughs> quietly and my Done first job well, <laughs> was with an educational bookseller thank goodness because I got to you know I got to read all the books and learn on the job but I was you know 18 months into that role and very small family run business by the way and they said to me Raylene because that's that's my name raise my stage name <laughs> they said we think it's time for you to move on and not because I was doing a bad job but mm. they could actually see that like a crustacean I'd outgrown my shell and I was starting to get a little bit uncomfortable and I needed to go and shed that one and and grow a new one and I was these days I never feel as grateful so grateful for these things these yeah. very very simple gestures by human beings who didn't know this wasn't in a book this was just the basic human spirit saying I can see something and we're brave enough to address it Yep. So. That's the thing. A leader doesn't have to go through an education system. Nope. You know, my grandparents, all four of them, migrated from Italy. Yes. No language, no money, no family. Yeah. And yeah, you know, they led a, a new generation through into a different country. Yeah. And there's many stories like that out there. Oh, I would love to hear it, Paul. But guess what? At 12.58, we've got Ken Lyons coming up next. And I, Ken, you were looking through the window beseechingly at me because you wanted to come in and talk but I was really bogged down <laughs> in a conversation with Paul so I will pop in and I'll see you later but good luck with your his health program I'm sure you've got a fascinating guest uh, coming up if anyone has any feedback or requests or suggestions for topics you can write to me at ray.bonnie at 3wbc.org.au or contact the station directly with your complaints don't ask for me that's 039 285 Four eight four nine. Anyway, uh, guys, that's it for the day. Thank you so much, Paul, for coming in today. It's been a pleasure, Ray. Thank did, you for having did me. Did you have fun? I had a great time. Was the was the funnest bit us uh, singing? Uh, I think the <laughs> interludes with the air guitar were probably amongst the highlights. <laughs> well, there you go. And this is a little bit of a shout out to the late Chuck Berry, who passed away yesterday, which is a little bit sad, but he did leave us with some great music. You're listening to 94.1. It's 3WBC and have a great week, people. Thank you.